three weeks ago on Easter, uh, we wanted to do something as a church that we were resurrection people. We believe in a coming kingdom, the renewal of all things. We believe in the resurrection of Jesus, redefining everything in this world and what that means for our lives. And so we said, what can we do? And we decided to partner with Love Columbia, specifically their program, the Extra Mile Housing Program, that they build house, or they, they buy houses, transitional houses for families that become suddenly homeless. Families live in these houses. They're part of the very holistic program of Love Columbia to help them with lots of things in life to where they can eventually four to nine months reset and be able to afford their own housing, all those kinds of things, have coaching, have relationships. And so we said, let's raise money as a church to help Love Columbia buy houses that they can turn into transitional houses for families. So we said, gosh, we, we want to do one house. If we can do two, that'd be great. And then I carelessly said, if we could do three, wouldn't that be awesome? Not knowing exactly how much these houses cost, but our wildest dream was actually doubled. This is what we raised in the three weeks as a church. It's a big, it's a big clap. The most exciting thing, well, it's exciting the, mo the money, but it came from just a lot of people that wanted to join together as a church and give together generously as a church to make a difference in one family, well, five or six families now at a time, depending upon how much we can buy these for. The goal is to buy houses, fix them up, so either five, maybe six, uh, we can do that. We're going to be a part of that process with Love Columbia and we'll keep you posted on what's going on. But this is a big deal because there's something about it that's very much exactly what Jesus wanted, wants his church and his people to be all about. That's especially true in the passage we're looking at today in Luke chapter 11, where Jesus talks, it begins in Luke chapter 11, where Jesus talks about greed versus generosity. Now, I've preached on greed a few times over the 24 years I've been a pastor here. One of the things I like about preaching on greed is that nobody gets mad at me because nobody thinks the sermon's directed toward them. <laughs> Everybody thinks they don't have greed. So there's just great vibes. You're smiling at me, I'm smiling at you. You're all thinking of somebody who really needs to hear this and you're glad they're here. So that's awesome, we're all in a good place. But anytime Jesus says something that challenges the reader in Luke, we should at least ask ourselves, am I in this some, some, somewhere to some degree? The question is, how would you know? How do you know whether or not you have greed like Jesus is talking about in this passage? Well, let's, let's jump in and, and find out what Jesus says. It's in verse 37, it begins, verse 37, Luke chapter 11. Luke says, when Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to, to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. That's how they ate. But the Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. Now, you might be thinking, you know, that just makes sense. I mean, there's so many germs. Jesus has been out with all the people all day. Who knows who he touched? Yeah, you'd think he'd want to wash his hands before eating. That's just a basic hygiene kind of thing. That's not at all what the Pharisee is thinking. They didn't know about germs and hygiene back then. The Pharisee was part of a political sect, a political group, a political party in Jesus' time that they were separatists. And of course, like all political parties, to some degree, they're very religious. And so they were separatists who in some sense, we're theologically aligned with Jesus, but it, they're the people that Jesus seems to be going after the most. And so what's happening here is that this guy is really shocked at Jesus for not washing his hands because in the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, a priest, not a Pharisee, that's not the same thing, a priest was required to wash their hands and feet before going in and touching the things inside the tabernacle, just as a ritual to show that God is pure and his, his presence is pure, it was a symbol. What the Pharisees did over the centuries later is they just applied that to everybody. Everybody needs to wash their hands before they eat. 
and all these kinds of ritual purities, it wasn't a hygiene thing. It was a, a righteousness kind of thing. If you didn't do it, you weren't being righteous. And so this Pharisee is shocked that Jesus is neglecting righteousness. Jesus is neglecting a basic thing that would be righteous. If Jesus is a righteous man, he wouldn't neglect it. So Jesus uses this as an opportunity to finally unload on Pharisaism. Pharisaism is when people try to justify themselves through an outward performative righteousness. I'm doing an outward thing, I'm performing a righteousness, and this righteousness is, is justifying me. I'm morally good, I'm even morally superior if you're not doing this as well. So Jesus lays into it, here's what happened, the next verse says that the, then the Lord Jesus, the Lord said to him, now then, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and dish. He's, he's probably using the cups and dishes there and making an illustration. You clean the outside, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people. Did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? And he goes on and he says, but now as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor, those who can't do anything for you in return. Be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. If you want to start cleaning up, it comes from being generous rather than washing your hands before a meal. Woe to you Pharisees. That word woe is an Old Testament prophet word. It means you, you're going to have a calamity coming upon you because of what you're doing. Woe to you Pharisees because you give God a tenth of your mint and rue but you neglect justice. That word here means fairness in court, not having a bias toward those who are like you who can do something for you, but being just toward everyone in a legal sense, and the, you, you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter, justice and the love of God, without leaving the former undone. What's the former? Is that you give a tenth of your, your, your income, your produce. Giving a tenth, uh, we sometimes call that tithing. The word tithing just means tenthing. You're giving a tenth of your income to the work of God. And Jesus is commending them for that. That's good. He said you should do that. But especially in Jesus' day when you, know, you didn't write checks, you brought your produce that was part of your farming in some sense. It was visible. It was public. It wasn't, it was an outside thing. It's a minimum kind of thing, and it's an outside kind of thing. And Jesus is saying, you're just doing the outside again. You're just doing the minimum, but you're really neglecting what is big, and that's just having a life of generosity, being generous with your life, seeing your life as a conduit of the love of God, a conduit of the love of God and justice for those who wouldn't get justice otherwise, and being generous with people, just generous with your spouse, generous with your neighbor, generous with a life of generosity with your coworkers, a life of generosity if you're an employer with your employees, and a life of generosity with those who are hurt and broken who can't do anything for you in the end. The idea here is they're neglecting the inside. It's, it's the inside where generosity comes from. It, it can't be measured. It's not something really anybody sees except one person, so to speak, at a time. You should tithe, that's the minimum, but really it's about a life of being generous. So, so in verse, go on in verse 39, he says, the inside you are full of greed and wickedness, you foolish people. Did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? Now what Jesus is talking about here is a lot of times we just sort of live life with what we can see. We don't see God, but we can see what's outer, and we don't really think that the creator, the one who made us, 
he's dwelling inside us. He sees, he's there. He, nothing he made is unknown to him. So he made your brain and he knows everything in your brain. He knows every incentive. He knows every motive. There's, there's nothing that, where God is not and nothing that God doesn't know. And so the, greed happens when we just sort of think this internal dialogue and we don't think God is there. We think he's just sort of where everybody else is on the outside. Even Christians, we forget, unaware, of how much the Bible says that the Spirit of God is inside us. And the Spirit of God is inside us, and and it's inside us where we have a dialogue with God. You ever think of that? That, that if prayer is this conversation with God... When the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.17 to pray continually, well, what it's not meaning is do some ritual thing always and don't do something else. It's just saying as you go through life, the Spirit of God is in you, that God is present in you, and you can have this ongoing dialogue with God inside. It's the inside. It's not just the outside. Where the things that matter most where we connect with God and it's from the inside where the motive and incentive comes to be the conduit of the love of God through generosity. But here's the thing. This is a strong comment. It could just as easily be translated, you fools. Jesus only says that twice in the entire Gospel of Luke. He refers to somebody as a fool Twice. A fool, in this sense, the word literally meant they're lacking sense. They don't have sense. That given the reality of God's universe, given the reality of what life really is, they're completely nonsensical in how they're living. And so Jesus calls this person, these people fools because of the greed inside of them. Here's what's really interesting. The, other, the only other time that Jesus refers to somebody as a fool in the Gospel of Luke, also deals with greed. It's chapter 12. It's part of the same context, really. Remember I said last week that Luke doesn't write in chapters. The chapters were added over a 1,000 years later so we could find verses and stuff. But, but Luke is just in the same context. And so in chapter 12, verse 15, he says this. He says, then he said to them, he's talking to the same people, watch out, be on your guard. This is the God of the universe who's, who's trying to teach stuff. He's trying to tell you how to live. And he says, watch out. Be careful. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. It's hidden. Nobody, nobody thinks they have it. It's sneaky. It's stealthy. And you don't know that you have it. So you have to watch out. Be on your guard. And it matters because be on your guard against all kinds of greed because, here's what Jesus has given, a little key to life. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. See, greed thinks that success is defined by increasing your standard of living. Greed thinks that, well, kind of what I'm supposed to do in life as I mature is to increase my standard of living. That's what it's... That's kind of what life is about, and that's what success is, is increasing my standard of of living. And and Jesus says, be careful, because here's the thing I can promise you, life is not about. It doesn't consist in the abundance of possessions. That's, That's something else. That's something different. It's not wrong. It's just not what life is about. And so he gives a parable. He, parable. he goes on and says, and then he told them this parable, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. So an abundance of possessions. He's got an abundant harvest from the ground. Now, immediately, if you're biblically astute, when you read the word the ground, you realize, okay, this guy got blessed from God. God's the one who made the ground. God's the one who owns the ground. God's the one who blesses the ground, the fact that he got an abundant harvest from the ground, well, that, that comes from God. We would say it in our time, in our day, because most of us here aren't farmers. There are a few. Now, we all eat what farmers grow. We only realize it. But, but God, I think it would say now, 
your brain produced a harvest of abundance. You're smart. You're educated. Or your, your mouth. You're good with speaking. You're good at convincing people of stuff. And that produced an abundant harvest for you. Or your body in some way, your athletic abilities or your strength as a worker or whatever it is, that these are things that have brought an abundance of possessions in your life, wealth. Or we might even say, like we say, your talents or your gifting. We use that word gifting because we recognize that everything in our life is a gift from God. Everything ultimately, like the ground, is from God and it's blessed by God if it yields an abundant harvest. So what Jesus is trying to say, what greed doesn't understand, the reason why it's so foolish and nonsensical to reality is that everything you have, your ability to make money, your ability to have any kind of a harvest of possessions in, in that kind of way, it all comes from God and is given to you by God. And in reality, in reality, it's a vertical connection with God. God has given it to you so that you can be a conduit of the love of God but through generosity. He didn't give it to you so that you can just think of yourself. That's the basic idea here of what Jesus is saying. But, but here's what's interesting. Jesus goes on and he says, but, but he thought to himself. He didn't realize that this abundant harvest was a, a vertical connection with God, something between him and God, something that God had given him because God wanted him to do something with it that was going to be a conduit of the love of God through generosity. Instead... He thought to himself, this is just an inside thing for him, inside his own dialogue, dialoguing in himself. He thought to himself, what shall I do? Huh, I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, he's again, just talking to himself. It's just a inside himself, no vertical connection with God about it at all. You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. He goes on, he says, take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Here's the thing. He's thinking to himself. He's saying to himself. He's making plans. There's nothing absolutely wrong with the ground giving him an abundant harvest. That was God. That's God blessing the ground. That's God creating the ground. He, that's not wrong. And it's, it's wise to not waste the grain, but to have bigger barns to store it. That's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. Where he goes off is he's talking to himself, huh, this has really made, made it so that I can, I can live my life. I can take it easy. I can drink, be merry, take life easy. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And all this abundance is really about increasing my standard of living. All this abundance is really about me. And this is inner dialogue that says, but God said to him, you fool, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, Jesus says, but is not rich toward God, not seeing their life as a conduit for, gener conduit for generosity, helping anybody that we come across because God wants us to be generous with the love of God in our lives, the blessing of God in our lives. The fool in the time before is because they thought somehow inside was their own domain. It didn't matter what their motive was. It didn't matter what their incentive was. It didn't matter. That was all their private world. The fool here thinks that, again, it's just an internal dialogue and that these things are about and they're for himself. And the, the thing is, the fool is always chasing the future, happiness in the future. If I could just have more, then I can take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. If I just have more, and there's never a sense of joy and happiness in the present because, well, life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. See, here's, I think, what happens. This is why Jesus says, watch out, be careful. It's really tricky. It's really stealthy. Is that we get more excited about our standard of living 
when we're least excited about the unseen abundance of God in our lives, in our future, and the future coming of his kingdom that Jesus described as the renewal of all things in Matthew 19, 28. We get more excited about life being the abundance of possessions when we're least excited about the abundance of God and his coming kingdom. We're seeing a small world. We're seeing our lives in the however many years we're gonna live in this world, and that means we have to do gain as much as we can for this world. We think that's just normal. We think that's what life is. And Jesus says, no, you're being foolish. You're not living in reality. How you're thinking is doesn't make any sense. It's not reality. Now, there's a dumb illustration, but it makes the point. It doesn't walk on all fours. There's holes in it. But there's this book by, by Randy Acorn, and he says, Alcorn, and he says this in his book, In Light of Eternity. It's a book I read a while ago. Uh, but he says, imagine a set of twins having a discussion. If they could, and they can't. So this is, right off the bat, this is not true. But in their mother's womb, if they had a discussion, just imagine this conversation. You know, one says, I keep hearing of a whole world out there, grassy meadows and snowy mountains, splashing streams and waterfalls, horses and dogs and cats and whales and giraffes. There are skyscrapers and cities and people like us, only much bigger, playing games like football and baseball and volleyball and going to the beach. Are you crazy? The other twin responds. That's just wishful thinking. Everybody knows there's no life after birth. Again, but the point is, if, if, if somehow you could sort of think about life in the womb, you would really honestly have no concept of life after birth. You wouldn't know what a giraffe is and cows were and dogs were. It, it would just be what you see in there, and that's what would matter most to you. Not realizing that you're just here for a time, but what's really coming is coming later. And that's what Jesus keeps trying to teach about life. We're here for a time, and, and we can think this is what it is, and this is how success is measured, and this is what wealth is, and all those kinds of things, and we're trapped in a small world with small thinking, and we're missing the fact that, no, there's something much bigger com coming, and the Bible never describes it. The Bible's not able to describe it. The Bible really never describes the kingdom of God. It just uses metaphor, imagery, phrases that are poetic, but the reason why it never describes it is kind of the same way, and this is where this breaks down, it's kind of the same way a baby in the womb really wouldn't be able to understand giraffes and cows and football and baseball and beaches. They have no concept of it, the renewal of all things when Jesus returns. And so the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 2, 9. It says this, and I'll invite the worship team up in a minute, not yet. Uh, it says this, it says, what no eye has seen nor ear heard nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Now just look at that verse. The coming abundance of God, the coming wealth, abundance of God. Remember the Garden of Eden, every tree that is pleasing to the eye and good for food, abundance. The coming abundance of God is something that no eye has seen, nor ear heard, the heart of man hasn't even been able to imagine it. What God has prepared for those who love him. This is the trick here because this is why Jesus hits greed so hard. Is because this is a promise for those who have grown inside in their love of God. Their love for God. See, again... That, that we're, we're most excited about our increased standard of living, often when we're least excited about the abundance of God and his coming kingdom. We're most excited about the abundance of our possessions and think that's what life is. When we're least excited, when we least imagine, when we least see what God has prepared for those who love him. It's inside where that is. It's not the outside that people see and give us credit for. It's inside where God is, only God is. And if we just have an internal dialogue with ourselves, we're missing the whole point of life. Is everything in your life that God has given you so that you can be a conduit for the love of God 
through generosity. So here's going back to the question. What, as the worship team comes back up, let me just ask this question. How would you know whether or not you have greed? Well, I, I think it's this, that when your standard of living is increasing in a greater proportion than your standard of giving. I, I think it's when you're more excited about your standard of living increasing than you are about your standard of giving, your ability to give and your giving in generosity. I think that's kind of the test. So Jesus says, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed because life does not consist in an abundance of possessions.